Thank you for joining us again for another episode of Let's Talk. I'm sure our guest this week is no stranger for many of you. He is M. Ravi, who is perhaps the foremost advocate for the anti-death penalty cause in Singapore. Ravi has represented several inmates on the death row in Singapore and has spoken out against the cruelty and the justice system that executes those caught for peddling drugs. Ravi is also a vehement critic of the human rights abuses in Singapore and is working to make the protection of human rights a feature in our legal system. Hi Ravi, welcome to the show. Hi Dilik. You have been involved in the anti-death penalty campaign for years now and you have represented a few inmates on death row who have since been executed and you have tried to get their death sentences commuted. Haven't they committed a crime that under our laws mandate the death penalty? The starting point here is not just death penalty per se. What we are dealing with here in Singapore is mandatory death sentence. That is, the judge who is passing death sentence cannot look into the extenuating circumstances of the individual when there are mitigating circumstances which are available where he can set aside the, the death sentence and order uh, life imprisonment. So that takes away the vital essence of judicial decision making which is discretion. And that discretion unfortunately is given to the president who has hardly given any clemency for the umpteen years that we know. But people say that these drugs are dangerous and can kill. Drug traffickers are therefore peddling death. Shouldn't they be hanged for their crimes? There is an international con consensus on this that drugs is not the most heinous of crimes. And Singapore is a signatory to it. And why a departure from the international norm or the standard? And interestingly, after the abolition of the death penalty in northern American states, there's a decline in these crimes. So how do you explain this corresponding pattern in terms of the abolition of death penalty and the decrease in uh, drug trafficking or such crimes? Where do these drugs come from anyway? Since you have represented the accused in some of the cases and you have seen the evidence, do you know where these drugs come from? You know, many of these parts of Asia, they have huge number of um, plantations that uh, grow poppy plants and, um, you know, and they produce heroin. And one of such country which had been identified by some international groups and even United Nations is Burma. What drives you to speak up on this issue and human rights in the broader context? What made you become so interested in human rights? There was one day I received a call from Mr. J.B. Jaratnam. He felt so aggrieved on account of his client. You can see, you can hear the outrage in his voice over the phone that, um, you know, he says that this particular case, which involves uh, death penalty involving a 22-year-old Malaysian boy, had already run its course, meaning it has gone to the Court of Appeal, it has already reached the clemency stage, and clemency was already denied. The courts just said, that look, we can't reopen the case because the matter is already concluded. The court does not have the power to reopen the case which had run its course. To which then I asked, to which I asked the CJ, are you then saying that an innocent man can be hanged in Singapore just because of procedural matters? That means you can't reopen a case even if the man is innocent. The Chief Justice just replied yes. The answer is yes. And when I looked at that reply, it just shook my conscience beyond belief. I was, I was really, really uh, shocked to hear that response. I mean, nowhere in the world you can say an innocent man can be hanged. So I then uh, took the opportunity when the next case came, and um, the case of Shanmugam Murugesu with his twin sons, and then we started the death penalty campaign in Singapore, started working with activists, and became more involved in other human rights issues like freedom of assembly, um, defamation cases and so on and so forth. What does law and your practice as a lawyer help you in your speaking up on human rights issues? Now, we have three arms of the state, executive, legislature and the judiciary which are meant to check on each other. How much of check can the parliament have? Mm -hmm. The legislature has on the executive. Mm -hmm. Parliament is a very, we have a very weak uh, opposition in parliament. 
we don't even have a strong civil society. So the important organ of the state, the judiciary, no matter how much of criticisms, misgivings one can have about the judiciary, the judiciary is an important place for us to check the executive when it wields so much of power, when it comes down on an individual that transgresses human rights uh, and uh, causes violations. I want to talk about something else, something that both of us are familiar with, and that is the Law Society. Recently at the AGM, there were eight council seats, but there were only four nominations. Frankly, the society is in a pathetic state. Why do you think that the Law Society is the way it is, and is it serving any purpose in Singapore? The Law Society has lost its luster that it used to enjoy before. And uh, increasingly, there is this notion that the big firms are playing a dominant role in the law society. I mean, if there is a, a motion being introduced, you can have five or six big firms with all their members coming there and vetoing decisions. And you know how the big firms are um, politically uh, correct in their positions. Um, the lawyers feel that they are thumbed down and to borrow the New York Lawyers Association's report on Singapore lawyers, they are cowed into passivity. That is something that we have to seriously open up and discuss. What is the problem here? The organization is gagged under the Legal Profession Act. How can it overcome such legislation and start to function as a proper law society like those in other countries? The uh, president of the Law Society, to be fair to him, Mr. Michael Huang, had spoken to the law minister recently to get this uh, legislation reviewed, but unfortunately, the state is not willing to do this. If lawyers can't speak up, who can speak up on legislation? Because they are a specialized uh, group of trained individuals who can give um, useful feedback to the society. Now I want to turn to a more personal subject. You have undergone some ups and downs as far as your mental health is concerned. How have you been coping and do you think that you have emerged stronger from your experience? During the time that when they reported about my hospitalization, they put their own spin on it. Unfortunately, they missed the whole heart of the story. And having gone through this uh, process, um, I realized that at some point, you know, the body was not able to handle the stresses. It just tells stop, but I never took this warning signs to heat. I must say that during these uh, challenging times, the Law Society as well as some of the, even the judicial officers as well as my colleagues gave me uh, tremendous support and which helped me to weather these uh, challenging times. I have uh, two lawyers, thankfully, who are extremely committed uh, in their legal work as well as they are very passionate in the way they do the legal work and they are part of a very good team to work with. And I'm inundated with work and things are moving well. So I have learned how to register those warning signs. That's basically, you know, that how I've tackled this. Given the fact that human rights work is emotionally sapping and financially draining, why do you continue to do the things that you do? In fact, I asked this question many times myself. Why do I have to get involved in such a controversial area which is so emotionally draining and as what you said, financially draining as well? What is important to me is not whether I have made any changes. But when I wake up in the morning, I ask myself, what is it that I have done? At least in my lifetime, I've tried. And that's the most important thing. That's very inspiring, Ravi. We've come to the end of the show today. Thank you for coming and sharing what you've done with us. Thank you for inviting me in your show. Thank you. My thanks to you as well for watching Let's Talk, where we interview personalities in the political and social communities in Singapore. Until the next time, from all of us here at the SDP, take care and see you again.